I want to start examining the consequences of the postulates of special relativity, especially postulate two. Okay, that's our special relativity. First is the consequence on simultaneity. So this is called relativity of simultaneity. This is discussed in section 2.1 of your textbook. So let's go back to the convertible with emitter and receiver example. But now the emitter is a source of light that makes a pulse of light. And the receiver is a light detector. We saw that with sound, the signals arriving to the front and rear bumper are non-simultaneous. But what's important is that observers in different frames, including the frame of the car, agree that the events, the, the two arrival events, are non-simultaneous. All inertial frames uh, would agree on that. Um, now we are looking at light. Okay, so now you have a pulse of light, and air is irrelevant. Okay, in fact, we can imagine it's a spaceship uh, with a, <clears throat> sound, a light emitter in the center and two light detectors on ends. Okay, just just to shake things up a little bit, imagine it's a spaceship. Okay, so you have a light emitter, and then you have two detectors, front detector and back detector. And this emits pulse of light. Now it doesn't have to be periodic signal, it doesn't have to be a sine wave, okay? So there doesn't need to be a frequency associated with it. It's just a pulse, right? That's moving with speed C. Uh, to the front, and then there's a back moving pulse that's moving with the speed C to the back. Okay, so uh, there are two frames. One is the ground frame, although what it really means it's any frame with respect to which the ship is moving. Okay, it's speed V. So here's frame S, it's coordinates. And uh, the ship's frame, we'll call it S prime. Okay. What happened here? Okay. And S prime, and as usual, we have two coordinates. So same setup, except that now it's with light. And let's again analyze the time required for the front moving pulse um, to move from the emitter to the detector and the time interval, it's really a time interval required for the back moving pulse to go from the emitter to the detector. So delta T F and delta T back, okay? And we will analyze it again from two frames. Um, <clears throat> so from frame S, The analysis from frame S. Actually, let's let's just say analysis from frame S. Okay, again, on the one hand, the front pulse moves what distance? Well, if the ship wasn't moving relative to exit, the front pulse moves distance L over two. Okay, again, so this is L over two, and this is also L over two. 
okay? So the pulse moves L over two if the ship wasn't moving, but since the front detector is running away from the pulse, the pulse has to travel an extra distance. What is that extra distance? It's the distance by which the front detector itself has moved. How far does the front detector has moved? Well, velocity times the time interval over which it was moving, okay? So the front moving pulse travels in distance L over two plus V times the time interval over which that front pulse was moving. And it was moving all uh, during the time between emitting and absorbing, that's delta TF, okay? You will find that a lot of what we're doing is really kind of bookkeeping, accounting in a sense. Uh, it's maybe, it requires a little bit of carefulness, but it's not like conceptually too hard, okay? It's just, we're being very careful about what we're doing. Maybe part of the difficulty of physics is that it requires this carefulness. Okay? Anyway, so that's my pep talk. Um, so <clears throat> on the other hand, same as before, on the other hand, This pulse moves with speed C, okay? So during the time interval delta T front, it will uh, move A distance C and delta T from. Okay. So we equate and we get delta T from the interval of time that it took for the signal to leave the det uh, leave the emitter and arrive to the front detector equals L over two divided by C minus U. This is exactly the same reasoning and really exactly the same result, except S is replaced by C, as with the car, okay? So uh, these, this is as seen as seen from frame S. Similarly, the back moving pulse travels a distance L over two minus V times delta T required to leave the, leave the emitter and be received by the back detector. So that's delta T back. Again, this is as seen, this is the time interval between those two events as seen from the ground. Okay. On the other hand, it travels a distance C and delta T back. Equate, and then you get delta T back, the time interval between those two events, equals L over two times C plus C. Exactly the same result as with the sum. Okay. So what about the frame of the car? And here's where the kicker comes in.
or the ship. Both pulses move a distance L over two. That much is again, still the same as with sound. Here's the difference. And both pulses move with speed C. Again, speed C. This is the difference. This is now relative to the car, to the ship. Mm -hmm. So from ship's perspective, delta t back equals delta t front. I really should use primes because these are as seen from the ship. But I won't bother with primes. Just remember, before we looked at delta t front and delta t back as seen from frame S, from the ground. Now it's delta t front and delta t back as seen from the ship. So I really should use primes here, but I want just to lighten the notation. In any case, we see that this is L over two divided by C. I'm going to do something a little bit strange. I'm gonna put this prime here, L prime. Why did I write L prime instead of L? Well, because we will see that those are actually not the same. So I just want to be honest or um, I want to be correct, but don't worry about it so much. The important point here is not the difference in the value of delta t back, this versus this delta t back, and not the difference in the value between this delta t front and this delta t front. The important point is the difference in simultaneity. The two events look simultaneous from the frame of the ship, but not simultaneous from the frame, from any other frame, which I call ground. And that's a big deal. So let's digest it and understand why it's such a big deal. So first of all, let's understand exactly why there's a difference between the light analysis and the sound analysis. What we had uh, before was this. In the ground frame, each pulse travels a different distance, but with the same speed. While in the car's frame, each, each pulse travels the same distance, but with a different speed. And the two differences compensate for each other such that we get the same result uh, uh, concerning a lack of simultaneity. Now, Einstein's postulate dispenses, dispenses of the idea that there is a special reference frame for light. It says that light travels with the same speed uh, regardless of what frame you look at. So speed of light is not referenced to a particular frame. 
but it's the same value for every for any frame. So as a result, as a result of this, what we have now is this: in the ground frame, each pulse travels a different distance, but with the same speed. But in the ship's frame, each pulse travels the same distance and with the same speed. And it's the same, same speed as on the ground. So we don't get simultaneity. Clearly, the events are simultaneous in the ship's frame. They travel the same distance with the same speed going forward and back. Uh, but it will not be simultaneous because now they travel different distances as seen from the ground, but again, with the same speed. And I want to remind you what we mean by measurement from the ground or from frame S. Okay, we do not wait for the signal from the event to arrive back to the observer. The location of the experimentalist is irrelevant. What we do is we plant light detection devices all along the road, all along space. And we endow each light detection device with a clock. Of course, we synchronize all the clocks, okay? So we synchronize clocks on all these devices in each frame. So in the frame of the ground, we lay out rulers, we place clock at each tick mark of the ru ruler, we synchronize all these clocks. Think about how to do that. That's an interesting question, how to synchronize clocks, even if they're very far away, okay? And then when an event occurs at some place and time, we record the time record the location, the, the position along the ruler where that event occurs and the time read on the clock at, look, at, the, at the location of that event uh, where it occurred, okay? And then we compare the times measured in this way and we conclude that uh, the interval of time between emitting and absorption at the front is not the same as the interval of time between emitting and absorption at the back because there's clocks placed everywhere. So we can always record the times and the clocks are synchronized. And we do exactly the same in the car or in the frame of the car. We have giant rulers glued to the car and there's a clock attached to every tick mark of that, of that ruler that's riding with the car or the ship. And we repeat the same procedure and we find that the time interval between emitting and arrival to the front equals to the time interval between emitting and arrival to the back. 